Yes, Nolan uh, asked me to speak and I said, I know you've already infused everybody uh, about Hamilton, so I better pick somebody else. And I've been longing for a long time to speak on Samuel Adams, so I thank you all for, for that. And to Paul Tukey for uh, uh, all the prep and logistics for this and great conversations about our singing backgrounds. So I will share this. Boom. And from the current slide. Okay. All right. In, uh, Samuel Adams, instigator for independence. Let's see if he, he uh, really earns that moniker. So I had to do some uh, search. Uh, as my IBM Global Services said, you must know your audience. So I looked into the history of the Old Guard and I found the longest continuing serving Old Guard. And uh, then I thought, well, I'm, I'm sure there were more Old Guards prior to that. And sure enough, And just to think I get to speak at the summit of all those old guards, so I thank you for that. Uh, it's really strange that I'm speaking to you today about anything to do with history. I was not a history fan. I was a computer science math major. And uh, what the strange events were, why I'm speaking here today is because I'm a pitcher down here in Florida, underhand arc knuckleball. And we had won the championship and went to Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, Windsor, our, uh, our right center fielder uh, got his typical beer and he got a Sam Adams beer. And Richard, our left fielder said, Rand, you're a patriotic guy. Do you know much about Sam Adams? I said, I, I, I don't know anything about that. So he said, well, you should read, you should, uh, read a book on Sam Adams. And uh, so uh, I decided for a whim to do it. And I was quite amazed and embarrassed myself that here being a patriotic American, and I didn't know anything about the contributions of Sam Adams. So I got uh, my first history book since college, and uh, being, a, being a type A personality, uh, after I read this book, I read another book by this author, Mark Pulse, because I said, if he could get Rand Cholet interested in history, what else did he write? And he wrote on General uh, Henry Knox. Uh, then for the next three and a half years, I read 51,000 pages on colonial, a revolutionary and constitutional period. And the reason I bring that up is that anyone can read a book and can be transformed by the author's presentation. So what's been helpful for me in some of the analysis work I did in my other presentations, which led me to late in the game to Alexander Hamilton was getting that 360 view and understanding and validation of, uh, of the events and the people. Uh, part of my journey was uh, studying 47 different what I call founding fathers and key contributors. I thought this was interesting, it's almost 10 years old, is what did uh, American citizens believe were the greatest founding fathers? So George Washington half, Thomas Jefferson a quarter, Ben Franklin a sixth, and then John Adams with the uh, miniseries at that time brought him up and of course James Madison. So I took those people, these are some of the other people that I studied in depth. You'll see Sam Adams toward the bottom right. And these additional people that I studied. Um, and I, I just fell in love with uh, the difficulty, the miracle of becoming the nation. Uh, there's another highly rated biography that's usually mostly uh, recommended as Iris Stoll's. Um, they're both fantastic, but what's uh, great about the Mark Pulse book is, is again, that analysis and the structure of it uh, that I found uh, really, really inspiring to me right off the bat. Why was he so un uh, underappreciated? And many of you there may not recognize or understand like I didn't that uh, he really wasn't one of the top contributors. Um, and we found that historians didn't really pay much attention prior to the revolution. Uh, he was never president and uh, history classes have little time so they usually f uh, focus on presidents and he left uh, he left uh, national politics in 1781 and went back to uh, boston sorry 
Boston and uh, Massachusetts. And he didn't care about himself the whole time. It was just mission. It was just about purpose. And, uh, and he never left memoirs, letters, or an autobiography that many of them did uh, to help shape uh, their reputation in years later. But the most important facts today are the next two slides. San Adams, the beer, and the brewery. We gotta get this out of the way because I know you just can't focus on the rest of the material without understanding this. Um, his father owned the shop that malted barley and is largely supplying it to breweries to make beer for the public. His father left one third of his estate when he died uh, to his three children and uh, <laughs> Sam received the malting house, neglected it. He didn't have any knack for it. Facility went to ruin. Uh, there was no evidence he ever ran a brewery or produced a beer for the public. <laughs> and now the rest of the story. Today, Sam Adams beer is surprisingly how, how recent this is. Uh, and uh, the pressure of speaking to the Summit Old Guard forced me to find a video where the founder pronounced his name. Because I didn't know if it was Koch or Coke. And I found out it's actually Cook. So Jim Cook, uh, in only 1985, very recently introduced uh, the craft beer in about 35 bars. His sixth generation brewer. Uh, the, the recipe used for Sam Adams beer was the same developed by his great-great-grandfather in 1860s, uh, based out of St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, today it's one of the largest and most award-winning in all the United States, just since 1985. And why? people relate to Sam Adams is all about the beer. It's sort of like Washington was all about wooden teeth, even though he never wore wooden teeth. It's all about him chopping down the cherry tree, even though he never chopped down the cherry tree and Parson Weems after Washington died, put together those moral stories for young children. Uh, there is, however, after Sam Adams Sr. died, an advertisement that said strong beer or malt for those who are inclined to brew it for themselves or to be sold uh, you know, uh, to the public. Uh, the state was put up for auction because of the delinquent uh, taxes. And uh, Sam Adams, it was fascinating. He went to everyone who might want it, who could uh, make an, uh, a bid at auction. And he told them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Those, this land tax grabbed by the sheriff is really wrong. And so no one ended up uh, taking his part, but it was all in ruins. He was born. Uh, September 16th, 1722, uh, you know, it went from the Julian to Gregorian uh, dates in uh, uh, 1752 in the United States. So this was the date he was actually born, but uh, anyone after, after March, not only did they add 11 days to your birthday, they would add, add a year. So you'll see that, not in this case, but in another one I'll show you in a moment. So the the... The date that you'll normally see is September 27th, but I saw a couple in my research that says September 22nd, but there's no foundation for that. So I said, okay, Sam Adams, where does he fit in? Well, first of all, um, when Richard asked me, do I know about Sam Adams? I said, I know he's sort of related. Well, he's actually a second cousin to John Adams. And this is how he falls in from an age standpoint with some of the other founding fathers. Many of you esteemed uh, historians will say, no, Walsh was born in 1732. No, he was actually born in 1731 about that because his birthday was before March 31st. He was actually born February 11th, not February 22nd, but adding the 11 days and adding the year. Uh, that's how we end up with the date we carry. You can see John Adams, Patrick Henry, about the same age, Thomas Jefferson, a bit younger and just relatively uh, Alexander Hamilton. Those of you who paid attention to, to uh, Hamilton for any bit of time, Ann Nolan's talks would have had the battle between 1755 and 1757. Well, Michael Newton, the most incredible current Hamilton scholar, discovered documents in Copenhagen in old Gothic Danish, three different sources that showed that actually uh, somewhere in the middle of 1754 for Hamilton. Uh, his family background, Grandfather sea captain's father having uh, that business, the, uh, the malting business, and he was a prominent, and he was a religious deacon. His mother, very artistic, 
and the parents married seven, thir 1713 and they were based in Boston, Boston. Well, Sam Adams uh, attended the Boston Latin School uh, as a youth and it's interesting, you likely know the oldest colleges in the United States, of course, Harvard in uh, 1636, but the Boston Latin School is actually a year earlier in 1635. And uh, after Harvard, 1636, second was William and Mary, yep, 1693. Third was St. John's, where I got to speak, that was pretty cool. And then Yale, 1701. Uh, he earned his master's degree. Uh, and this is really fascinating when you when you learn about what, what, uh, the rest of the, uh, Sam Adams' story. His thesis, 20 years before he started stirring things up as an instigator, <clears throat> three years before we declare our independence. Well, look at this thesis. Whether it be lawful to resist the Supreme Magistrate if the Commonwealth cannot be otherwise preserved. Uh, he strongly embraced Locke's writings and all of his communication and educating uh, fellow legislatures, fellow um, uh, readers of his, uh, his articles, uh, all born the citizens are all born with natural rights from God. He was very pious. He was a congregationalist. Uh, and again, folks on life, liberty, and property. And we hear about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, happiness didn't mean a smile on your face back then. It meant happiness meant you got to keep what you earned, which was property. So uh, that was later transformed into uh, pursuit of happiness. Uh, and the role of government was to protect rights, not limit them. <laughs> his first job after uh, uh, college was uh, to become a, an apprentice at a counting house, yet he really uh, didn't have the focus and attention for uh, ledgers and invoices, and so he went home to live with his parents. This is what else he tried besides the malting business uh, leading that to bankruptcy. Sort of like Ben Franklin, he did a lot for civic affairs, uh, overseeing a local school, uh, chim encouraging chimney inspections, a fire warden helped spread, uh, prevent the spread of smallpox and uh, helped develop instructions for members of how they should operate in the Boston, uh, sorry, Boston uh, town committees. Uh, he was made a tax collector and uh, it's pretty funny because he wasn't good at that either. However, he, uh, he turned a blind eye to a number of those that owed money such that later on they were indebted to him and it worked uh, to his advantage uh, when he got into his political and uh, uh, office roles. So it did, it did pay off after all. Uh, his first marriage, Elizabeth Checkley, whose uh, father was a, a very esteemed reverend. In fact, the reverend married them and also married uh, Samuel with a second wife later on. They had two of their five children uh, survived, a son, Samuel Adams, so three generations of Samuels, a daughter, Hannah, and uh, unfortunately, his first wife died uh, after a stillborn child in 1757. He re remarried to a 14-year-younger uh, Elizabeth Wells, who helped raise the children, and so many of the years uh, in those dates, 1774 to 81, she was alone. He rarely had a visit back home from Philadelphia. And uh, so here we're gonna talk about how he earns instigator for independence. All right, so back in, in uh, all, all this came after what we call the French and Indian War. In Europe, they referred to more as the Seven Years War. So you see the date 1756 to 63, well, look what happens, boom, 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 boom. The next year, uh, Britain wanted to recover some of the expenses of coming into the, uh, the colonies of North America and uh, wanted to recover some of that expense. So they had to get, er, to get some, develop some revenue sources. So the first thing, and we're gonna just spend a couple minutes on each of this, just so you can see how Sam Adams approached it and grew in his effectiveness as we step through these, uh, regular events and you can see how regular the attempts by Britain was to get that revenue. So 64 was Sugar, 65 Stamp Act, 67 Townsend Acts, 1770 mm -hmm. the Boston Massacre, Tax on Tea, 73, and then the Intolerable Acts. Okay, first off the Sugar Act and the, the 
provided duties on coffee, wine, iron, sugar, hats, and wool. Uh, Boston was the first uh, first uh, recipient of that news that there was going to be this tax, and uh, there's no big deal, sort of hidden uh, with with the. Uh, uh, different merchants, and so the the general people didn't feel or didn't see that actual tax. And the sugar uh, revenue actually piggybacked on an earlier molasses act that they never really collected, but now they're going to get serious about it. So Sam Samuel Adams was shocked that he was the only one that saw the danger of this happening because the the colony did not vote for this tax. Uh, and so as he was frustrated because no one was getting into action, he came up with this brilliant idea. Who really cares then? Well, it was the merchants. And the merchants had the ear of the king and parliament. So that was one of his brilliant analyses early on because Sam Adams was dirt poor. He had no status of any kind. I mean, obviously he was smart, he went to Harvard, but he had he wasn't recognized by anybody of having some some status within society. So he had to leverage other sources of strength. And he knew that probably his little works and maybe even in Boston wouldn't be enough to uh, influence um, Britain. So he, he, as you see these tax revenue attempts unfold, you see how he worked to, to unite the colonies. There was one attempt back in 1754 uh, in fact, Ben Franklin helped lead that in Albany, Albany, New York. Uh, and that was actually, of course, they were all British citizens uh, at the time. And the attempt was to unify the colonies against the French and against the Indians at that time. And it utterly failed and nothing came of it. So it's to show you that even someone of his status wasn't able to, to uh, pull people together. Uh, so this strategy for um, leveraging the merchants um, and what he did was uh, early boycotts of English goods uh, from Boston. Remember, the people with money had these relationships and revenue in Boston by doing trade and commerce with, with London. So that was their bread and butter. So it wasn't easy to encourage them to not import. And what, what's interesting when I researched about boycotting, uh, Mr. Boycott actually didn't come to the front until uh, 1880 in Ireland when he was supposed to be collecting rents for a landlord. And uh, there was a lot of pressure to lower the rents because of economic difficulties. He wouldn't do it. And so they all banded together to boycott uh, and no one was paying their rent. So that was the background of that. Um, so he was elected to the Massachusetts Assembly and he got up there like an evangelist, fire and brimstone, intense to wake up everybody. He penned his arguments, his first document uh, called for the co colonies to unite and to do a protest in a Congress and uh, to spread those boycott threats. Uh, and a consistent theme throughout his writings and his whole life was people's freedom rested on their power to self-govern and self-tax and taxation about representation was, was a big source of that. Uh, that manifesto of Samuel Adams was read throughout the colonies and uh, started catching people's attention. And of course, Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry always looking for something feisty to do. And so he decided to get involved more formally by uh, uh, becoming uh, an office holder in Virginia. Uh, so Sam Adams met with those store owners and uh, it, it broadened from Boston to New England colonies. Uh, he alerted that if you let this go, they're going to expand it and we'll lose control over our property, our happiness. And uh, so he, he started with this technique called circulars, that formal communication, not through newspapers, but amongst uh, the uh, houses and assemblies. But secondly, the Stamp Act. Um, the tax was pretty much printed on every piece of paper, uh, even playing cards, uh, all printed material except for books, newspapers, legal documents, and, and now people were a bit primed and uh, not, not too well received. Ben Franklin was representing uh, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts uh, in England, and at the time, Franklin didn't really feel it was unreasonable, and he said, we may as well have hindered the sun's setting not to expect uh, revenues to be collected uh, within the colonies. 
uh, ministers and legislators are now going on record uh, thanks to thanks to this alertness of uh, this, uh, uh, this temptation to continue to take the, the work and efforts of, of the colonies. Stamp agents were threatened. I mean, threatened badly. You know uh, all about uh, tar and feathering and uh, property destruction. Uh, so the, the Boston legislature sent letters out to the other states saying, hey, join us uh, in this. And, and a few of the states declined. Uh, the state governors were getting nervous because uh, the, the, the leaders of the assembly under the provincial leadership of the governors uh, were starting to feel a little bit too independent of that control. And so they would often shut down the assembly so they couldn't make any more proclamations or publish any more standings. The governor at the time, Massachusetts Bernard, the Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, who later became governor, told London, the Stamp Act is received among us here with as much decency as could be expected. It leaves no room for evasion and will execute itself. But then South Carolina deliberated on it with speeches and everything, and they joined strongly, and their position was Massachusetts sounded the trumpet, but to Carolina's owed that it was attended to. Within weeks, nine other states attended. You see the growing effectiveness. Sons of Liberty proceeded to burn and destroy government offices, even Hutchinson's home, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, the Sons of, the Ameri of, of Liberty uh, had thousands of people joining. Um, this confirmed to London, yeah, see these colonists, they're troublemakers, they're mobbish, they're unruly, and Sam Adams go, oh, wait a second. We won't be respected. We won't have proper leverage if we're perceived that way. So then he said, we must use reason. Uh, and so he, he uh, called for the Stamp Act Congress in New York, where nine states met. This was the first step of uniting uh, in person with delegates. And the first ever united petition was authored for the king and parliament. Uh, here's, here's what really mattered. The colonial merchants uh, supported and uh, sent numerous millions of pounds of canceled orders because of the Stamp Act. Stamp offices were forced to resign because of the threat to their homes and their body. And so look at this, a procession of English merchants in 50 coaches met with a king and the king rescinded the tax the next year. These little troublemakers have, have caused the king to rescind the, another tax. Uh, king George III met, repealed it. Oh. And look, this is quite profound, our, our uh, famous Adam Smith. The expectation of a rupture with the colonies has struck the people of Great Britain with mortal terror, more than they ever felt for a Spanish armada or a French invasion. The repeal of the Stamp Act among the merchants is a popular measure. And I have one, one little thing that could say it better than I. One little paragraph. Yet Samuel Adams possessed a rare political genius that was only beginning to show itself at the age of 44. His achievements so far were stunning. During the previous two years, he had roused the con continent, engineered the first boycotts, helped unite the colonies for the first time, implanted a reverence and stoked the love of liberty based on individual rights. <clears throat> he supplied colonists not only with the reasons to fight for their rights, but with the political weapons to do battle. Here are just a couple of quotes that just show his spirit a little bit. Uh, for true patriots to be silent is dangerous and we shall be respected in England exactly in proportion to the firmness and strength of our opposition. Thirdly, the towns and acts. Uh, William Pitt became weak and was the official uh, uh, head of uh, prime minister, but he really wasn't active. And so the uh, uh, Charles Townsend uh, told parliament, America should be deprived of its militating and contradictory charters and its royal governors Judges and attorneys must be rendered independent of the people. I underline that part. England is undone if this taxation of America is given up. So this third attempt now laid duties on tea, paper, paint, and glass. <laughs> so what did Sam Adams do? He drafted a petition to the king, stressed that the colonists were not represented in parliament. <clears throat> 
interesting. Uh, the colonies were so devoted and connected and uh, to the king. I, I for a long time after this, it was Parliament where they had no representation, where they got offended that Parliament would attempt to take some of their property. Uh, that draft uh, within the assembly was approved and sent to the king. Uh, that circular was uh, not only drafted, but it was finally approved by the House uh, and uh, on top of the petition. And then that petition and the circular were sent to the other colonies. The reception now was quite enthusiastic. And there was a great advocate in, uh, in London uh, that published both of these and it made a major impression on the readers both over in, in Britain and in America, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, <laughs> and somebody else uh, also passed resolutions in support. Virginia then endorsed it and urged each county to do so. Those true sentiments of America informed them of their rights and they accepted his arguments. That was the basis for much of this opposition. Uh, this was not lost on London. This is becoming dangerous, so battleship was on its way to, to, to Boston. Then King George instructed Sam Adams and, and Massachusetts Assembly, you need to delete this petition from those official records. Um, they, and, and, and Massachusetts got a little bit concerned because they thought they could come down real heavily on them and it could be re re some real trouble. But <laughs> Sam Adams rallied the House, uh, drafted a letter, it was passed with an overwhelming vote, and they renounced the, uh, they refused to renounce that, that circular. Very feisty. And so he was then officially labeled as the chief incendiary of the colonies. And by March of 1770, most of those taxes were repealed, except for the tax on tea. Uh, so then the king told Massachusetts Governor Brown, dissolve that house. We don't want anything official more coming out of them and then having any credible uh, basis going to the other states. Uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, labeled Sam Adams one of the principal and most desperate of the chiefs of the faction and called him the all in all who needed to be taken off. So they looked for witnesses that would claim that Sam Adams did some treasonous stuff so they could, they could arrest him and take him to the Tower of London and try him there. Of course, they would have kept him for a long time before he ever got trial, so he'd be out of the way and, uh, and therefore marginalized. But they couldn't find anything uh, uh, the British Attorney General couldn't find sufficient grounds. Uh, so Sam Adams kept writing, publishing, speaking, and uh, networking throughout. Now the Boston Massacre. Uh, tensions were, were rising because with these, these uh, ships coming into port, it was just, uh, they were just too close in contact with the, the British military, which, which the People were offended that they would be in their, their home city. And, uh, and so it's, it's really not clear. It wasn't really the British who just decided to fire and kill those five people. It was actually egged on by some young kids throwing snowballs and yelling and it got intense. And, and then once it started, it, it just escalated. Um, in response to that, Sam Adams gathered thousands of people in 1770, which forced Governor Hutchinson then to move the troops away from the town uh, and the townspeople across the bay. So essentially, it was actually the troops that were isolated. Um, and the courting of troops was also uh, a problem. Sam Adams is now a hero. The British had retreated again. Uh, the, the Tea Act. Uh, um, I should mention that many of the acts that were passed in England didn't take uh, effect for usually three to six months as they were trying to prepare, prepare for the eventuality, both in the colonies and the enforcement. So the, uh, uh, what's interesting about the Tea Act, it was a sort of devious where, where Britain said, uh, we're going to provide this, this uh, surplus tea, easy to really, really inexpensively. But the thing was, there was that tax embedded in it. And therefore, Sam Adams, and they were, he alerted people that 
it is still a tax. And if you allow permission this one time from parliament, they will continue to and don't fall for it. Uh, one of the one of the uh, important points is that uh, they did destroy the T, but they did not uh, uh, destroy the ship or the property. There were 342 chests of T destroyed. Uh, so, so Samuel Adams is at a point where some of his technologies and uh, uh, social media getting out to to the bigger citizenship uh, was effective, but it was reactive based on an incident. And so he said, I need to take to, he, he needed to take to the next level because after the disputes, things would halt, people would calm down. He needed to keep them, you know, pumped up, peaked up, and he foresaw that more was gonna come. So he needed to build on the circular letters with his technology, and he initiated the committees of correspondence. So it would be proactive, it would be ongoing, it would link not only locally within Massachusetts, but throughout the colonies. And uh, uh, the, uh, the British leadership and provincial governors saw that Sam Adams was being uh, effective and respected and it was getting uh, power. So he was offered all kinds of positions if he would relent. And of course, Sam Adams didn't care about money or, or positions, so he didn't go that way. So these are the strategies that Sam Adams was using effectively, publishing. Uh, not only was the Massachusetts House but there was also the Boston Town Council uh, where, he, where he was almost every time elected as the clerk, which was really the lead activator and, and documenter of what was happening or the moderator, but they essentially the same thing. He not only drafted things, then he worked hard to bring them along, get them finalized and passed. And uh, he used the circulars among the legislative bodies, committee of correspondence, uh, encouraging boycotts, grievances, shared communications, petitions to the king, and then he published replies from the king, which inflamed the colonists even more. So he kept building, building effectively. Now we're on to the intolerable acts after the Tea Party. Now, now uh, London is livid, Parliament is livid, and so they're going to punish Boston, and uh, so they uh, they. They had passed these intolerable acts or coercive acts as they were known for those few months. And so they blocked commerce, they blocked the port. So the act was in March and this lit a fire, not only there, but this became clear. This was evidence that other ports could be at risk and boom, everyone was on alert now. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about 1774 to 76 is now things are starting to escalate. Um, and, and now Sam Adams has much uh, compatriots uh, helping support in the other colonies now. Uh, so once the port was closed a couple months later, then Sam Adams called for the first Continental Congress. And uh, for those three months, Congress met in Philadelphia. And the last little note here, was from uh, what ends with Patrick Henry quote about Sam Adams. The committees of correspondence allowed Adams to monitor the activities and mood of the country better than any man in the Continental Congress. To opponents, this intelligence network gave the impression that he was directing events rather than responding to them. Through his correspondence, he received information from across the continent. Many members of the Continental Congress recognized that Samuel Adams and John Adams together formed an unequal team. John Adams became a champion of the floor. Sam, Samuel controlled activity behind the scenes. He spoke little, preferring not to have his fingerprints. Uh, and uh, yeah, Patrick Henry detected his influence saying, quote, the good that was to come from these Congresses was owing to the work of Samuel Adams. All right, and here, who knows, you don't have to answer out loud, but who knows where the first Continental Congress met? Awesome place. Carpenter's Hall. And if you wanna be really respected, make sure that the single quote is after the S, it's plural. <laughs> um, and 
it was it's such a beautiful place. You ever go to Philadelphia? It's one of my favorite. His, so much history happened there. Franklin's uh, Lending Library was there. The American Philosophical Society started there. The First Bank of the United States was there. It is incredible. It's on the National Park Service grounds, but it's still owned by the um, by the Carpenters and, and the and the Union. Well, now we move to 1775 after the first Continental Congress had met. Um, and uh, battles of Lexington and Concord, which you've all heard of, but the catalyst for that was that they were through with Sam, Sam Adams. And so warrants went out. And so a search party went from uh, Cambridge, Boston, westward, and, uh, and that's where Sam Adams and Hancock were hiding. And uh, then that's where those uh, battles started. Uh, of course, you've heard shots heard around the world. May 10th, uh, Samuel Adams called for a second Continental Congress in response to just a few weeks later. Uh, they met uh, June 14th, the Continental Army was formed. The next day, Washington was named commander of the Continental Forces. And this, the second time they met in uh, uh, what, what we know as Independence Hall today, it was the Pennsylvania State House. Many people thought the first was there also, but it was under renovation. Some people told me earlier, but I checked with the chief store and people said because the Quakers had a lot of presence there and they hated war, they wouldn't allow the state house to be used for the Continental Congress, but that was not supported by the research uh, that I found. Now we move uh, further into 1776, the Battle of Breed's Hill, many of you know, Battle of Bunker Hill, that's not accurate. So again, if you want to be hip, and sharp as you all are, it was actually on Breed's Hill where the battle occurred. Uh, that success of the leadership of Generals Washington Knox forced the British to evacuate the port. Lord Howe was very upset and said, listen, we'll pardon everybody involved with all the opposition to the mother country, except for Samuel Adams, Ben Franklin, John Adams, and Richard Henry Lee. Um, and uh, then the Articles of Confederation uh, were being developed and Sam Adams had was a key member of developing that. And later in life, um, when he left national politics, he went back to, uh, to Massachusetts. He was elected, uh, not just the Senate, but president of the Senate. He didn't attend the Constitutional Convention. When you study what happened, the, well, the rowdier ones that felt like Patrick Henry and, and Sam Adams really were not embracing of the need for a national government, any stronger than the Arts of Confederation. So Sam Adams didn't, didn't attend. But when it did come to Massachusetts, he was reluctant for quite a while, but then uh, uh, there was some work done on some uh, uh, conditions that would like them to consider a Bill of Rights later. And so both John Hancock and uh, uh, Sam Adams did sign. He was elected Lieutenant Governor. <coughs> um, Hancock passed away. And, uh, and uh, Samuel Adams became governor of Massachusetts, then he retired. He died um, at age 81 in 1803. Here's where his uh, grave is. So it's a very accessible, and this is just a, an enlarged. Samuel Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence, governor of the, this Commonwealth, a leader of men and an ardent patriot. A statue is outside of Faneuil Hall that was uh, sculpted by uh, Miss Ann Whitney. And one thing that's interesting, I mentioned uh, about uh, there was sort of mobbish in the beginning, and then uh, and he had to fight you know the the war for independence, but then then the the uh, intellectual enlightened ideas had to be put in place. It had to 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 rule the day, not mobbish reactive behavior. And uh, there's a great book out there uh, by Michael Newton, who's also ended up uh, joining into the Hamilton research and is the leader. It's called Angry Mobs and the Founding Fathers. It is remarkable, brilliant, smart, showing how the mobs had to intimidate enough and then how it transitioned. Just a real great book. So again, the key actions leading from... Uh, from a turmoil with the British uh, mother country to 1776, Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Townsend, 
Boston Massacre, Tax on Tea and Tall Blacks, and the Battles. Sam Adams. Now, I don't know, some of you may be in the boat I was in um, that, yeah, we heard about the beer, yeah, sort of related to John Adams, but when you look at what he did, and no one else did this, it wasn't uh, George Mason, it wasn't uh, Jefferson or John Adams or George Washington or the Lees from Virginia. No one else did all of these things to get the colonies united to push back effectively to get the taxes repealed and to get to the point where there was realization bringing people out that we needed to separate uh, that we weren't going to have taxation without representation or or to even have assemblies anymore of their own doing so uh, i i really appreciate the opportunity to learn about him and to share someone who really deserves I really see he and, and Hamilton, they really started their work 10 to 13 years prior to where a lot of the effectiveness of their labors really showed to be true. And neither of them cared about financial wealth, sacrificed their lives, their families, uh, you know, didn't, were, were without for an awful long time. But Samuel Adams, um, and so let's look at some of the things and see if they're deserved. Um, some of the peer recognition, he was hailed as the father of the American Revolution. We don't hear that very often. Who was the father of the American Revolution? As Nolan Ash would say, can we say father of the American Revolution? Uh, Thomas Jefferson called him the patriarch of liberty. And John Adams stated, without the character of Samuel Adams, the true history of the American Revolution can never be written. For 50 years, his pen, his tongue, his activity were constantly exerted for his country without fee or reward. And just the last couple of slides, Thomas Jefferson also stated, for depth of purpose, zeal and sagacity, no man in Congress exceeded, if he any equaled, Sam Adams. And lastly, John Adams stated, Sam Adams is zealous, ardent and keen in the cause, is always for softness and delicacy and prudence where they will do but is staunch and stiff and strict and rigid and inflexible in the cause. So a toast to uh, Sam Adams. And see if I... so thank you very much. I'm available for uh, some questions. Okay, everybody raise your hand, your virtual hand. <laughs> there are so many more fascinating details that would be too laborious to to share with you all that are really really fascinating i'll just share one as you're thinking about your questions is that some of the communication between hutchinson as governor of Massachusetts got to the king and Ben Franklin found copies of letters, sent them back to Sam Adams and he ended up getting approval from the assembly to publish them. And that was another real death knell in the relationship. Questions? Uh, well, let me say this, this is fabulous. So, so beautifully researched and you know, somebody we barely knew about and this is a revelation and it's wonderful. Thank you for bringing this to us. I'll point out to everybody, um, Nolan is not in this meeting. And the reason is that he had accepted, he, he had accepted an invitation to speak somewhere else before this was set up. So he, he regrets he's not here now. But uh, so he's not here to ask the first question, but, um, <laughs> but uh, let's see who else has something to ask. All you, uh, I see a few hands. Uh, you do? Oh, I'm not seeing. Who's any. calling? Is it? Oh, is oh it, John, uh, John Tomaszewski. They're not floating to the top as they normally do. John, I see him at the top. Well, something's wrong with my. So, John, um, Joel, let yeah, me say hi. a great, great talk. Uh, I never knew that he had so much to do with uh, our country. Uh, my question is: Did any of these acts? Uh, physically affect his businesses or business do you know 
uh, they didn't affect any business because he went bankrupt and lost the the uh, uh, attention to do anything with business. So he totally became, for I think 30 some years, just involved with Boston politics, uh, writing articles for the newspaper, the Boston Gazette, uh, and uh, attending in Philadelphia for those number of years. So he never was hurt uh, business-wise or financially. Of course, he had no money and didn't earn money. So no, he did not, he was not hurt personally which is a good point because the merchants would really be hurt terribly. They were the ones that were at risk, but, but Sam Adams knew that was the leverage where, where uh, England would, uh, would listen to, to the merchants. And the merchants were probably more behind the king, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it was all their money. That's what gave them status and wealth. Why, why boycott, why limit? that uh, for personal reasons and to keep their commerce going. Very, very difficult to encourage someone who had no money, nothing to lose. Hey, you you put up all your assets that you have to lose and join the cause. So you know he must have been pretty persuasive. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, John. Mitch. Hey, Rand. Uh, I'm a Mitch. question on uh, a more generic issue of history. And we've been learning a lot in, in, in the, the old guard and, and in general about uh, history of, of the United States that, that has been really uh, whitewashed over, papered over, uh, yes. slavery, uh, various wars, and it sounds like Sam Adams is in that crowd, uh, specific to Sam Adams and more generic to the whole issue of, of uh, what history we should be teaching uh, the next generations down, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're biased towards saying that, that uh, Sam Adams should get a, you know, more than a, uh, you know, a one line in the, in the eighth grade history books. How do we do that? And how much should we, we elevate Sam Adams? Uh, that's a good question because the, uh, the, uh, the amount of time available to teach is so short. In fact, an example of that, I was in Philadelphia and uh, many of you may not know who actually wrote the US Constitution that we see today. Many people think it was someone from Virginia, James Madison. It wasn't, it was Governor Morris. So I went and I talked to the Rangers after they gave his great introduction about James Madison. So I said, why don't you ever talk about who it was that took all these, these sections of stuff that came out of the, out of the Constitutional Convention and, and made it eloquent and succinct and, and inspiring. Of good, and they go, well, we're just limited on time. So it is a real, real challenge, Mitch. Uh, I really don't know. I, I, I've had challenge since the 13 years I've been involved with Hamilton about how do you permeate because for so many decades, generations, centuries uh, in, in, the, uh, in the universities, uh, which then educated many others uh, that wrote books in the publishing houses would publish and reward those that lined up with the Jeffersonians such that Hamilton was squeezed out. And still when we go with superior research we're still not allowed in the A club. Michael Newton, who has far better information, is not given all the opportunities that some distinguished professors are given uh, that were taught the old understanding and the exclusion of Hamilton. So I really think it's a battle, Mitch, and I have no idea. I've been battling for years uh, through the AHA Society to, to ratchet it up. It takes some continue it almost takes a sam adams to help sam adams uh get some attention with a consistent thing in fact hamilton had a quote that success is dependent on the projector remaining constant so that's what the aha society the alexander hamilton we're saying we're trying to provide that consistent message and it is increasing of course the musical you know exploded for but somebody has to care somebody has to get that regular and people like uh, like you of esteemed level when you hear, you know, just just encourage people uh, uh, to to uh, to learn about it. It's a battle. It, uh, no pun intended. So so Hamilton has his ten dollar bill and yes. Adams has his beer. So that's kind of equal. <laughs> so all we need to do now is get a play on on Broadway for Sam Adams. Yes. Everyone wants a play now. 
Yeah, uh, John uh, you Adams. Know, Eight hundred bucks a ticket. You get all the free Sam Adams you want to drink. That would that. Now that's a great strategy. <laughs> Tom Berger. Ah, uh, yes, that was a great talk. I hope to uh, bring it to the attention of our local school district so that the history teachers <gasps> are aware of it. Don Goldberg. Yes, hi, uh, Brand. Thank you for a great talk. My question is: um, the author, a uh, well-known author, Malcolm Gladwell, has for a number of years been putting out a, a podcast titled "Revisionist History," um, and a lot of the topics I found fascinating, where he visits something in the past and gives a different spin on it. The particular one I'm raising is when he talked about the Tea Party uh, in Boston Harbor. I think everyone pretty much much knows that those people on board dressed as Indians weren't really Indians, but most people think that they were local colonialists uh, who were upset with the Stamp Act. His research, his research indicated that they were actually smugglers who were upset that the, that the new price of tea with the uh, Stamp Act included was still less than they had been uh, successfully charging. And they right. were the ones who were so angry that they threw the tea overboard uh, so as to limit the market and force people. Yes, to that. Absolute, absolutely right. And I, I didn't mention, and I should have, that, that uh, Sam Adams actually called the assembly together and, uh, and, and, and got people, I'd say, riled up. Uh, he wasn't personally involved with the activity but he raised it to a point where those people as you mentioned that did care enough to take some action would do it um in fact there was a lot of discussion around that whole tea party where other colonies were very upset that property was not respected that the tea was destroyed i've heard some claims but i haven't found research to confirm it that um that they made sure that 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 the East India Company was paid back for that lost tea. But I, I can't confirm it, but there that that really upset a lot of people in the other colony. They felt that they lost credibility and standing by taking that action. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Mort O'Shea. Hi, Rand. Great talk. I, I wondered if your research on uh, uh, Sam Adams. Uh, uh, taught, taught you anything about his children who survived him. Did they do anything? Uh, of, yes. Of um, note? And, and I, I was going to dig into it more, but I was concerned I was getting too much material, and so I didn't edit it down. His son actually served in the Revolutionary War, and uh, uh, I think as a surgeon and uh, or medical person, and he died, and his pension or whatever gave, gave Sam Adams a few shekels. Uh, so I did read that, and his 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 daughter Hannah married someone. But I, I just I just briefly looked at it, and moved on because I just felt I, I had too much material. But uh, thank you. Yes, Peter Merritt. Uh, for much of his life, it seems so he didn't have positions that uh, paid him any substantial money. I wondered how he supported his family and also his activities. Were there did he have some kind of financial backers? You know, there's nothing I've read or researched that showed how he did that. They didn't even say that when he was sent for all those years in uh, Philadelphia through First Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, um, and all, they didn't say that each, I mean, they were given money to go, but I, I never heard the, uh, serving in the assembly. Of course, he became a lieutenant governor and governor, and those must have been paid positions. Uh, but there really wasn't talk about earnings. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Well, I just, I just wanted to thank you for uh, making the connection with uh, today's world by talking about uh, information technology and social media. Boy, you nailed it. I mean, <laughs> he just uh, he just understood uh, that uh, how he managed, he needed to get the message out to rally people to the cause. And, uh, and so that was brilliant. 
Uh, Paul. And thank Paul. you. Unless you want to elaborate on that. Go I, ahead. I do. I want to elaborate because what drew me, I think 47th out of 47th of those key contributors and founding fathers, since I avoided Hamilton being an egotistical, overbearing, uh, self-centered person care about money, belief it was about, um, it, when you live and you study <laughs> Hamilton and you study Sam Adams, it's mind blowing compared to any other person of the time because they did things every day to move things forward. They did multiple things in parallel. They, they had a good sense of human behavior that others didn't. Some had idealistic or overly negative views, but they found that, that fine touch. And they both learned how, uh, how to move those who did have money like Hamilton getting the the uh, the first bank and and uh, uh, monetizing the debt uh, so that the people would provide money there. The people did have the money, and then that could be used since we didn't have cash or much specie to move forward. So, so just like the merchants of Sam, so when you when you immerse yourself in Sam Adams a generation earlier and Hamilton, it is the most precious thing to see how. They only cared about mission. They only cared about the nation. They didn't care about themselves. And, and they had this sense that it was worth it. You know, most people would give up or feel it, you know, they didn't either want to be a personal risk or be isolated or frowned by. So uh, I, I really have found Hamilton and Sam Adams to be beyond anyone that I read that was, that was, incessantly working. Of course, Washington was the number one man, but he was very visible, esteemed, money, uh, positions, and all. And he did the most incredible of everyone because that, that got us to successfully become independent and successfully put those foundations in place. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about the extensive research that I can't bring to you all because it, it's overwhelming and try to do in one hour. But those two are the most precious of the 47 and the most impactful um, uh, outside of, I'd say, I'd say Washington and maybe John Jay and Madison. Rick Garber. Uh, wonderful talk. Enjoyed your passion and your insight. Two questions. The mental stability of the king at that time, how much of a factor do you think this was in the revolution? And does it disturb you that uh, the January 6th uh, insurrection had so many uh, connecting links to uh, these patriotic people? Uh, on the mental instability, uh, the Samuel Adams time frame was a bit earlier than when it got in the main the main time frame, so it wasn't as an impact uh, to uh, to the proceeding. Plus, Parliament uh, and the Prime Minister were really um, uh, defining and initiating a lot of the work, and, and the king would you know, support it or give feedback or pushback, but uh, that didn't seem from any of the studies I've done have the impact. For January 6th reminds me of many other times, even in Hamilton, that the people, for example, oh, Hamilton is the one who created the national debt, uh, where the debt existed and Hamilton actually packaged it, spread it out and got it paid off on time. Uh, uh, and so every, I, I find, uh, and then Hamilton was for big government, you know, no, he wasn't for big government. He was for small, uh, he, he was for much power and energy for those few things that were delegated from the U.S. Constitution to the executive branch. So I find for every side of the political spectrum, each person will utilize uh, the founding people for their for their to their advantage, they embrace them. Uh, sometimes the uh, the Democrats would support uh, 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 Hamilton, then the Republicans would, and then in betweens would, and then the Independents would. And uh, so what I found is they will always buy used by everybody, and they will be selectively uh, quoted at times. And so 
I, I'm not surprised. Uh, in fact, they did that back in the 1700s. They did that in the 1800s and they did it in the 1900s and they're still doing it today. So I'm not surprised that people try to, to leverage them. Thank you. Good questions. Chris Jager. Uh, thank you for a, a great talk and filled with so much information. Uh, I got sort of a two part question. Uh, one is uh, a bit hypothetical. If, if there weren't Sam Adams, would the revolution have actually happened? Or would have that been a very, maybe, probably not? The, the other is um, how, how, how Sam Adams and Ben Franklin may have, may have worked together. Uh, did Sam Adams uh, bring Ben Franklin along to the, to the point that Ben Franklin became uh, more of a an advocate for revolution. That those are great. Wow, those are great questions. On the first one, I've thought about it a bit, not just with all the founding fathers and what I call key contributors and Sam Adams and Alexander Hamilton. Is like if Sam Adams didn't do what he did and work early for the focus to to educate the people to get support by the influencers in the assemblies of the states. How would have that? It, it it may have been it may have been so gradual, and the, the 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 majority of people may have felt they had the right, uh, other than maybe a few people, and and it either would have been late to the explosion and the headbutting and separation, uh, or it would have, or it would have been from nothing, nothing, nothing to uh, a major instead of gradual. It, one of the great things about Sam Adams in the way he did it is that there was understanding because of the time he worked on it through the circulars, the community correspondence, the articles and the letters he wrote. Uh, and it's something, it, it helped prepare people in a way where, well, think about the French Revolution. One of the problems of the French Revolution is they didn't have time to work from, from here to there. And so it was really out of control and all mobbish. So, so this gave an opportunity to work a little bit of the mob out and to find more enlightened ways to get there. So I think it would have been horrendous, not, not guillotine wise, but I think it would have been really disruptive. Um, another, the second question is really a great point because when you look at who decided to join when in the March towards independence, Many of the leaders were very late because they were people of means and they were enriched and successful by that strong connection with Britain. They didn't want to risk that. Um, plus the power of parliament, the power of a uh, naval force, the power of the military. There was so much power. How are these little, these little runts you know, writing in their little, uh, you know, social media and, and are, how are they ever going to realistically compete? You know, it's a nice concept. Yeah, it's nice to be independent, but how are you really ever going to compete with all this again? It's like a fool's errand. So it was these, these gradual steps that were taken by these people uh, like Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, the assemblies, the state that, that, um, that got it moving to the point where those reluctant people started being peeled off. And when uh, your question is very astute in that uh, Ben Franklin being the uh, representative uh, for Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, he was, he was not concerned in the early stages. Uh, but then uh, smart Sam Adams uh, did realize that Ben Franklin being there and, and how articulate and how persuasive Franklin can be, he started communicating more and more and I, I believe uh, seeing the different uh, responses that Franklin had, that uh, he did bring Franklin along, he alerted him. And, and very often we can go on with our lives, but when someone alerts you to something, you see it and then you recognize it. You recognize mm -hmm. him. I think that's what Sam Adams did for Ben Franklin. And to the point where my earlier example was that Ben Franklin ended up taking uh, written correspondence from the Lieutenant Governor or Governor, I can't remember the time, in Massachusetts to the king, he got his hands on him, gave him to the dangerous Sam Adams uh, and saying, uh, and got permission that it could be shared, but not 
but not reprinted. Uh, it could be shared vocally, orally with the Massachusetts, but and then it, it, he knew it would unfold, and two months later, it ended up being uh, being printed. So uh, Sam Adams did uh, influence, and, and his his writings were were so inspiring. He took the enlightened writers and and put it in terms that more people could could embrace, and uh, so. Uh, he not only brought Franklin along, he br brought along a lot of people uh, in Pennsylvania, Virginia, that had a lot of influence. New York was a little bit of a, was a lag. Uh, New Jersey was was in the middle uh, of, of the influence, except for, of course, uh, Elias Boudinot and William Livingston uh, and some others. They really helped, helped to lead, uh, but not that demonstrably a uh, set of actions and writings as a Sam Adams. Okay, we have uh, one last question from John Tomaszewski. Uh, not so much a question. Your uh, speech was so great, it did my mind, uh, went back to a, a miniseries called The Sons of Liberty, which struck me very, uh, you know, just showed me a lot of things that I didn't know was going on with the Revolutionary War. So I just wanted to bring that up if anybody wants to get in a little more depth. It is a dramatization, so... Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. got a lot of its own things, but it I found it really interesting and it's on available on Prime for two bucks if anybody yeah. wants a little more in depth. Uh, John, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was trying to talk how we moved away from some of the mobbish behavior into these uh, these uh, mature approaches. However, the Sons of Liberty and the smugglers and the privateers, they played such an important role because Without, you can't, with, with someone, that, someone has all the power, you can't just try to influence them with words. It's just not gonna work. So there had to be this, this other force, even if it wasn't authorized or approved by the leaders, that threat, that fear of, of fear and, of a tar and feathering, of burning down your homes, uh, yelling with uh, lighted torches outside your home and your workplaces, uh, got a uh, stamp, uh, tax collectors to resign. It, it just really, really uh, was very effective and a very important role uh, in, in that. In fact, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, talking about Alexander Hamilton's time frame, it was very similar in that uh, uh, they, they tried to, to uh, uh, in, in Western Pennsylvania, fight that. And that's why Hamilton knew you cannot let this stand that states and individuals do not have the right to thwart the U.S. Constitution, because if they do, they'll continue to do it forever. So that's why Hamilton convinced Washington to have a larger force of 12 or 13,000 they ever had uh, led into battle during the Revolutionary War, put his uniform on while he was president, and Hamilton was there, Secretary of Treasury in his uniform, marching westward across Pennsylvania. So they learned lessons also that you have to counter it, uh, but it does play an important role. And in fact, it played an important role for Hamilton in Whiskey Rebellion because Hamilton reached out and said, I see why this is difficult for you small producers, but they didn't want to talk to him. They wanted the issue. Uh, so, uh, and even Washington reached out and said, let's work together. So they just wanted the issue, but, um, but the Sons of Liberty and all played an incredible role. Even the Tea Party, uh, crew played in Portwell because it was so visible. It was over the board, but again, occasionally you have to draw attention. It seemed back when that power forces were so strong. So thank you for that, John. Uh, Rand, uh, thank you for a, a truly enlightening talk. Uh, Nolan was absolutely right. Uh, you know, so many of us, uh, myself included, uh, were uh, totally ignorant about the role that Samuel Adams had to play in our revolutionary history. And so we are uh, very grateful that uh, one day, uh, one of your ball playing buddies was able to uh, pique your curiosity in Samuel Adams and revolutionary history. Thank, thank you. you so much, Steve. Thank uh, you, uh, we, Old Guard. We, we have two ways, Rand, of, of uh, thanking our speakers at the Old Guard. And uh, Joel or Paul, if, if you could share the screen with the uh, certificate. Whoa. Uh, the first is a certificate of appreciation. Nice. You'll notice uh, in, uh, in glorious pink detail on the lower left-hand side, there's an orchid there. And 
Yeah. Uh, you'll probably be interested in the history here. In 1930, when the Old Guard was founded, the city of Summit was at the epicenter of the nation's uh, orchid growing and distribution industry. Wow. As, as a result, uh, our founders <laughs> rather naturally chose the orchid uh, as our logo and our symbol. Beautiful. And, Thank uh, you. We also have a second way of thanking you. And uh, again, Joel or, or Paul, if you could unmute everyone. It's done. Uh, that second way is the uh, the old guard salute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.